It is a tradition in the church to begin the 40 days of Lent with Jesus' 40 days of fasting and testing in the wilderness. And this event that we've just read is a richly symbolic moment. And it's tied to multiple biblical events. Why, why 40 days out in the wilderness? Well, if uh, you remember from Sunday school days, there are all kinds of biblical events where 40 was involved. Let me just scroll through some of, the, some of them for you. The rain of the great flood fell upon the earth. Noah built an ark. How long did the rain fall? 40 days and 40 nights. And Noah and his family waited for their deliverance from evil and rain, as God had promised. Moses. Moses fasted alone in the presence of the Lord up on a mountaintop for 40 days and 40 nights before he received the Ten Commandments. Elijah the prophet fasted for 40 days as he fled to Mount Horeb, where he encountered God in a still, small voice. And if you remember, for 40 years, the Hebrew people wandered in the wilderness. After they escaped slavery in Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, trying to remain faithful and follow God toward the promised land. So Jesus, beginning his spiritual leadership with four day, 40 years, days in the wilderness is deeply symbolic of numerous events in the history of the people of God. Great, fine, whatever. What does that mean or say to any of us? What's our takeaway from this 40 days in the wilderness? Here's what I want to do. I, I want to present three things, two initial ideas that I just want to throw out and let you ponder. They will apply to varying degrees, depending on who you are and what's going on in your life and where you are in your stage of life. But after those two, I want to offer what I think is the major spiritual message that all of us can benefit from. So here's a quick synopsis. First thing I want to talk about is testing or exercising our faith. Then the whole identity question, who am I? How can I fulfill my life purpose? And then, and the one I really will spend the most time on is the last one, the nature and source of evil in the human condition. Firstly then, the story of the temptation of Jesus. What's the point I mean, this is a sign to read every year at the beginning of Lent. Why does the worldwide church want us to read this every year? What's so important? What's the message that we're supposed to receive? And the answer is testing or exercising our faith. I picked up a book last year at a rummage sale. I don't think you can see it. I should have given this to Ken. Sorry. Younger Next Year, A Guide to Living Like 50 Until You're 80 and Beyond. Turn Back Your Biological Clock. Oh, good. There you go. I don't know why I picked it up. I mean, it doesn't apply to me at all, but... <laughs> it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And I'm in that category somewhere between 50 and 80, that's all I have to say about that. But listen, let me read you a couple of quotes directly from it. Exercise tells the body to grow. Sitting too long tells the body to decay. And then their, their summary word is, exercise six days a week for the rest of your life. And all of the clinical evidence, and this is written by a cardiologist, uh, an internist from the States, and they've done research all over the place. If you exercise, you can delay the aging process at least until 80, sometimes more. Wow, that's a pretty good reason. Now, if that principle holds biologically in terms of our physical health, 
Might it also be true concerning our faith and our spiritual health? Here's the thing. What God does with our faith is something like workouts. What God did with Jesus in the wilderness was put him through a 40-day workout. God sees to it that our faith gets pushed and pulled, stretched and pounded, taken to its limits so its limits can expand. You know if you work out, you can build your endurance, you can extend your stretching ability, you can expand your strength and muscle power. Faith is apparently kind of like the same thing. I read a novel a couple of years back about an Anglican priest, and his next-door neighbor comes over and is talking with him one day, and this is what they're talking about. And she says to him, if faith doesn't get exercised, it becomes like a weak muscle that fails us when we need it. And he says, maybe we should be willing to thank God for every trial of our faith, no matter how severe, for the greater strength it produces. I'm perfectly willing to say it, but I'm continually unable to do it, said the priest. And his neighbor said, ah, there's the rub. It's, it's easy to talk about, but when you're in the temptations and the challenges and the testing of your faith in life, it's hard to do it. That's the reality. Here's another initial idea for some of you to ponder, and this is about the who am I identity question. How can I fulfill my life purpose? Look at Jesus. He's just come from his baptism. He's been announced as the Son of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he goes out into the wilderness, and he knows he's about to start his career, his spiritual leadership career. And he has to make choices. And the choices are put before him. He can have anything he wants, all the food, luxury. He can have fame. He can have power and control. Is that what he wants to do in a supernatural way, take control of everything and enjoy human earthly life? He's got to ask himself the question, what, I, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What should I be about? What's my life purpose? And as I thought about this, I realized all of us, all of us go through this at different stages to varying degrees. I would propose that most of us as young adults are asking unconsciously or consciously, where am I going? What should I do with my life? We're choosing our career. We're sorting our goals and values. We're shaping our personality in the 18 to 35, somewhere in there. We're working it out. It's exciting. It's challenging. It's a wee bit scary. Go to the other end. How many people in their senior years look back and evaluate? Kind of with a mixture of satisfaction, but maybe also with regret. What did I do with my life? Has it worked out? Have I accomplished? Have I fulfilled a purpose? Did I meet the goals. So at at both ends of our adult life, I think this is most prominent, this question of identity and how can I fulfill my purpose. And Jesus faced it at the front end of his journey. But what about in between? In those 40 or 50 years from 25 to 75 or beyond? I think that in between, there's a tendency for us to get swept up into life, just keeping up and keeping going. And sometimes, sometimes in that category, the temptation is to just just be reactive. You're not even thinking, you're just reacting to what's going on, trying to keep up, 
You're controlled by outside forces. You're pushed by events and trends around us. And rather than committing time and energy to periods of reflection, rather than hitting the pause button, which we should do, and thinking, could there be some changes made? Am I on the right path? How might I, how might I alter and do this a little differently? All of that, I think, is valuable to ponder particularly depending on what age and stage of life you're at and what choices you're wrestling with. All right, those two were the short ones. Having offered those two message ideas out of the story of the temptation of Jesus, temptation as a sort of a workout for our faith to strengthen us, and temptation as a way to sort out our self-identity and our values. So now I want to present what I think is the major spiritual message that is relevant to us all, whatever category we're in in life right now. And that's this, the nature and source of evil in the human condition. Jesus, the story tells us, was confronted by the devil. Satan, Jesus called him. But that was 2,000 years ago, and we know a lot more now, so perhaps in our postmodern world, we're considering dropping our ideas of a devil, of a Satan. We might lean toward dismissing the thought of a personal and active source of evil in the world. But on this first Sunday of Lent, as we remember Jesus' temptation by Satan, we might want to reconsider We might might want to ponder the mystery of evil in individual persons and in entire people groups. Maybe it's too easy to dismiss the idea of a personal devil, especially if we've never encountered real evil. So we can stand back and kind of dispassionately attribute bad behavior in a person or in a society to, well, to poor education, poor social structures, poor child-rearing practices. But the pain and anguish some victims of injustice have suffered is very real and very chilling. I'm going to take us a little bit into our recent Canadian history. It was our own general, Romeo Delaire, who, when trying to keep the peace in Central Africa, saw the massacre of innocents by a groupthink mentality that went beyond even insanity into some blackness that cannot be clinically explained. Rwanda, 20 years ago. Romeo Delaire wrote of his encounter with one of the instigators and leaders of that horrific mass murder. And General Dallaire defined it as, shake hands with the devil. He had looked into the eyes. He shook hands and looked into the eyes. And it was chilling what he saw. Few of us, none of us, pray God, will ever be part of something like that. And yet we can have brief moments. Even looking at ourselves, we can have, when we wonder what, at our worst, what we might be capable of. I recently read a letter from a woman who had been a minister for a few years. She was responding in her letter to a professor of religion who had said the idea of the existence of a personal devil or Satan was not very helpful. Those who say when they've done wrong, the devil made me do it, they're just trying to get out of their own sinful behavior. And so this professor was kind of dismissing any outside force of evil in the universe and said, it's all us. 
It's in us, it's on us. And he may be partly right, but the woman minister wrote in response, what you say about there being no real Satan may be true. However, as a woman pastor, I have come to believe that if evil doesn't have a personal name like Satan or the devil, it ought to. I came into the ministry because God called me here. I have sacrificed and worked to gain the skills to be a pastor. The churches I have served are full of good people, at least better than average people, who are in the church wanting to be good and to do good. And for the most part, my ministry among them has been well received, but not completely. I've seen good people do some terrible things. I've witnessed a depth of cruelty, some, but not all of it, directed toward me, that has shocked me. I'm now willing to believe that our lives are not entirely our own, that we are, at times, in the grip of something, someone, who leads us down dark paths. In short, I am more willing than you to conceive of Satan. Her letter hit home and changed the thinking of that university professor. The prof was at Duke University, William Willimon. And he recognized from her letter and he thought and pondered and he remembered the early church had the same problem. It was St. Paul, the early Christian leader, who wrote these anguished words, this self-confession, and he wrote it after he became a Christian. Listen, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? I know what he's talking about, and I'm guessing you do too. Every once in a while, the sort of inner turmoil that Paul felt. And maybe that's why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ask to be rescued from the time of trial, to be delivered from evil. Some versions of the Lord's Prayer, the newer ones, actually say, deliver us from the evil one. Have you noticed that? Have you prayed those newer versions? Deliver us from the evil one. That translation makes it pretty clear there is, there is a conspiracy against God's good kingdom. In the personal source of evil, the evil one, it now makes sense. And in the early church, again, the first letter of Peter, he writes to young Christ followers, discipline yourselves, keep alert, like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. In praying, God, deliver us from evil. We acknowledge that God's power is greater than any foe. The power of evil must be admitted and taken seriously, yes, yet not too seriously. Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Meaning the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is greater than anything in the world. Evil is real. Yet the cross and the resurrection of Christ tell us that evil doesn't have the last word. Evil is a threatening power. Though ultimately a defeated one. Though the battle rages Monday through Saturday, every time we come to church, we are saying we know who won the war. 
When we pray for deliverance from evil, we acknowledge that we do not have the resources in ourselves to always win the battle, to resist evil. The Lord's Prayer is so honest. The power represented by the name Satan has real has real power in this world and in our lives. But the good news is, just as Jesus was able to resist the wiles of Satan, to reject his tempting offers, so we also have the power to resist. But it's not from ourselves. In our weakness, we reach out, and there is deliverance. One of the ways that Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the uh, 12 steps, is we had to reach out to a power greater than ourselves. And one of the ways AA enables us to reach out to a power greater than ourselves, and the chief means through which that power intervenes in our behalf, is by putting us, not in isolation, but not as individuals, but as a group. The community strengthens us to be free of the temptations of Satan. Jesus stood alone in the wilderness against Satan, but we don't have to stand alone. That's the good news. Standing alone as isolated individuals, I'm no ma- you're no match for the devil. And maybe that's why we're here this morning. You're not alone. We're all in this together. The church stands together amid Satan's temptations in whatever wilderness you may find yourself. At this point in your life, Jesus, who knows what it's like to be face to face with evil, Jesus stands with us, with you. Here, the good news this first Sunday in Lent, although temptation is very real, Satan does not have the last word. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, we are now and always victors. Amen. Let me pray. Holy One, Lord Jesus Christ, we never know completely when evil will come into our lives, and we always know that we need your help. and We need the help of each other. So put us in a warm, safe community. Give us strong friends who we can lean on. And let the power of your presence not just hover around us, but move within us, restoring our confidence, emboldening our resistance, and magnifying our love and joy that we are your disciples. We do not stand alone. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.